Welcome to week nine, I guess it is. Um, and we're going to start covering aggregates today, and then if time permits, we'll start covering joins. Um, the first part is aggregates, if I can get, as usual, this didn't work. So aggregates are functions. So you guys know what functions are from Java. At least I know for a fact you know what a function is from Java. That much has been taught. Um, I shouldn't make fun of the Java prof when I'm recording, but you know, it is what it is. So aggregates are functions, they're SQL functions. These are universal. The basic aggregate functions exist in all SQL servers. So whether it's Postgres, MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft's database, IBM's database, they all have aggregate functions. Some servers have more than others. Postgres has a lot of aggregate functions. You can do full stats analysis with it if you want. We're not going to touch those. This isn't a stats class. But the functionality is there for standard deviation and all that jazz. Um, but what are aggregates? Aggregates are designed to summarize data. So having a million rows in a table is fine. Having to actually figure out what that million rows is good for is a different challenge. So realistically, Aggregate functions, that's where they come into their own. Their purpose is to literally summarize the data in your tables. Um, they are used in the field selection area, and this will be like last week where I'll cover the first part of the lecture. I'll do some demo, and then time permitting, I'll do the second half. Um, aggregates are normally paired with one or more display fields. As uh, When I do demonstration, you'll understand what I mean about that. Just saying there's one that's, no, there's a few that normally that you can use without pairing with something, but normally you want to display something to go with it, a field to go with it, otherwise it's useless information. If you have just a number, 52, what does 52 mean? Or if you have a series of, you know, 5, 10, 25, 10, 5, 3, but you have nothing describing what those numbers are, it's useless information. Um, if you have display fields, there's another called clause called group by, and it must be there. Except in MySQL-ish. MySQL 8 finally forces this issue, it fix forces this. Before MySQL 8, you could use aggregates without a group by. It was really dumb, because uh, you're defeating the point of using a group by, because it, it just tried to be clever, and it never worked. So the most common aggregates that are used is the first one is count. It counts the number of rows in your result set. It doesn't count the number of rows in your table. It counts how many rows are being returned by your query. And it gives it to you as a single number. Min, max, opposite coins are the same thing. They either give you the maximum value or the minimum value in a given field. So if you're using numbers, it'll give you the biggest number or the smallest number. If you are using um, al alphanumeric, It'll sort alphabetically and decide which one's biggest and the smallest. Um, average figures out, surprise, the average of a field. If you know how to do an average in math, this does it for you, so you don't have to think about you know, summing up the columns and then dividing it by the count of rows. It does it for you. And believe it or not, the average function is actually more accurate than you trying to do it by you being clever, because uh, it handles the rounding better. A uh, sum, it adds up the values in a field. So if you want to know how much an order total was, you'd sum up each of the order lines. Ta-da, you have an order total. Just like you do when you're adding up your little receipts. You go to the store and you start, you start adding up your, hum, you know, in your head as you're going through, oh, that's about a buck fifty bananas. That loaf of bread is three fifty. So now we're up to five bucks. The database does the summing. Uh, Postgres has 14 additional aggregate functions specifically for stats analysis. So, yeah, if you want to do stats, it's the database for you. Um, now, also with the aggregates, I also bring in the concept of aliases at the same time. Uh, aliases are used to rename objects for the duration of the query. It's a temporary name. So, in other words, you're giving it a nickname. Once it's done running, it forgets the nickname was ever there. You can rename fields or tables. You can... You get renaming fields is good so that you have valid field names. When 
it's being received by a program. So uh, by that I mean, you know, you got a Java a chunk of Java code, and it retrieves rows of data. And if you are returning an aggregate without renaming it, you got a 50/50 chance you'll end up with an array element that has an invalid name. Then good luck getting it. Um, so you could give it a nice name that's easy to work with. Um, later, when we talk about joins, renaming tables becomes important. And there's an example on here. I'm just going to move my mouse around to point it out. If I can find my mouse, there it is. So there's an aggregate. I'm counting star as customer count. So this as customer count means I'm renaming count star. It's going to come out as customer count. Literally, the column is going to be called customer count. Normally, what would happen is it would return it. It would call the column count star. And that's what it would name it. And depending on the programming language, sometimes they don't like having array elements with special characters in them. PHP doesn't care. C Sharp cares. So, you know, depending on your language, it may have problems. And you see at the end here, from customers C, I'm aliasing customers to C. So instead of having to type in the whole phrase customers, I just type in C going forward. So it makes it shorter. Um, customers is a bad example because it's actually a fairly short field take a table name, but you know, if you have order has many products, you could shorten that to OP for order ordered products. Okay. So sometimes you need to use string functions also when you use aggregates. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually switch and do a few aggregate examples before I continue so that the concept of the aggregate doesn't get lost as I work through some of these slides. Over here. All right. So I showed you guys this last week and the week before. I'm playing with ThinkCube again, just so you know. And as you saw down here, 10,100 rows returned. When you are accessing the database within an application, be it Java, PHP, Python, take your, pick your language, you're not going to get this nice, cute little piece of text. If you wonder how many rows there are, you'd use. So I'm counting everything here, count star. So what this is doing is it's counting every row in its entirety and adding them up. And it gives you the exact same number, 10,100. But this time it says it returned one row because it returned one row. What I can also do, which I'm going to give it an alias so you can see. Because if you look at the results from earlier, if you're following along, you'll just see this is just called count. And depending on what is receiving the data set, this may return as count star, may return as count. But if you're counting more than one thing, you'll have count, count, count. And is anybody here familiar with PHP? One, two, maybe three. What happens in an array in PHP when you have the same key? It only keeps the last one. So if you return count three times, only the third one will be kept. That means you're, you're losing two columns worth of data instantly. Totally useless. Um, or at least you're losing the ability to access those three columns, all three columns. So if I were to give it an alias like this, and I run that again, you'll see, it's hard to tell, but there. You can see now it's called customer count. And sorry it's so small, but at least on the recording, it'll actually be decent. Um, it's been renamed. So now. It's usable. It's presentable. And if I want to make it more useful, I tell it to group it by city. So now what's going to happen is, remember earlier I discussed about, hey, look at all these numbers that mean absolutely nothing. Here's an example of numbers that mean nothing. Three is for what city? One is for what city? One is for what city? We don't know. But you're seeing now that that's what the group by does, is it creates bins. Anybody here ever do a survey in school? Not as filling out the survey, 
but actually handing out a survey for whatever project, stupid project you had to do. Because usually surveys in school are usually for stupid projects. Just, oh sure. <laughs> Some people like those. When you were the one that had to go talk to people and you didn't like talking to people, it wasn't fun. Um, that's why you usually try to find partners that were very verbal. And the, when you were aggregating your results, you'd say, okay, well, first things first, I'll add up, okay, we've managed to do 1,000 surveys, and out of the 1,000 people, we want to say, how many people answered question one in a certain way? How many people answered question two in a certain way? <coughs> and what you're doing is you're, create, you're aggregating by questions. So how many people answered question one true? And that's a bin. So when you use group by, it creates bins. And the bins are cumulative. So if I were to, um, I'll include the city in here just so you see what I mean. So right here is I'm going to include the city and the group by. Now you can see that it made, there's three people in Baycomo, one in Stein, one Asabrock, 14 in St. Denis, 19 in Springfield. And these are bins. It basically creates a bin. And if, for example, think of it this way. Uh, same again, back to the survey example. And in, ca in case you had a survey where you actually filled out a blank instead. So you know, for your first choice would be, you know, out of the following options, which pick you right in your number one choice. And, you know, your choices are wings, coffee, and something else, tea. And everybody, instead of doing circles, they, they, you know, they wrote in the word coffee. So as you'd start, you'd go, oh, choice number one, this pile is coffee. This one's tea, that one's wings, and you just start making piles, and you're adding them up based on that question. So you then you add up the questions based on that stack of paper. I'm talking doing this the high school way, where you know half the time they don't know how to use a computer properly, which you know they they make stacks of paper, then they count the piles of paper, and then they put them all back together, and they do the second question. It's really tedious, but that's literally what this is doing. Is it looks it makes a bin, it hits Big Homo first, so it'll create a bin called Big Homo. It'll throw in one in there. A little later, it found a second one. It's big homo. It'll throw it in that pile. A little later, it finds another one. Big homo adds it in that pile. And essentially what it's doing is every time it hits the same string or value in the aggregate bin, that's which is what the group by does, it's doing basically a variable plus plus. Right? So, you know, in Java, you do the good old post increment, I plus plus. It's basically what it's doing. It's going, oh, value plus plus but it's creating it on a huge scale of an array, and it's adding up to each of the array elements, which you guys haven't learned about arrays. But you'll know what I mean when you learn about arrays in Java. Um, like I said, b uh, bins are cumulative. So if I were to add first name, and this will probably end up with just ones all the way down, Hello. Oh, it's just name. Think about the wrong database. Sorry, guys. My mistake. And I go execute. You'll see now there are only ones because I created a second bin. So f what it did first is it added it up by the city, and then it added it up by the names inside that city. And obviously, if I oh, there are some repeats. Cool. Uh, apparently, I got some Minity Mueller's in Berlin. Three of them. So what it did first is it added up by Berlin, and then, let me just sort some going to, there you go, here's all the Berlins. So it added up all into Berlin, and then it added up all by name inside Berlin. So each of these people have unique names inside Berlin, except for, well, Melanie Muller. She doesn't have a unique name in the city. Um, same thing with uh, Emil in Hamburg. Apparently, lots of repeats in Berlin. Dublin has some repeats. Belfast has a bunch of repeats. So even though there's more than just those people in Belfast, those are the ones that appeared more than once. That's how, add, that's how the group by works. So each bin you do, it adds an extra bin, and it starts subsorting into those bins. You can run as many aggregates as you want at the same time. Um, so for example, I'm going to go, I'm going to switch to the order lines table. I 
Hang on, I just got to double check. Yeah, that's the one I wanted. Okay, so I'm not going to play with this one. It's going to be a straight up sum, just so you guys want to show you what sum does. I'm playing with order lines. So I got $21 million worth of sales in order lines. And it's actually, for those of you that have looked in there, there's 100,000 rows or so. So that's how fast it did the math. Um, I can actually do multiple aggregates. And it'll show you the grand total, which order line had the most, which order line had the least. But because I'm not breaking it down by anything else, it's giving you literally the absolutes. The total total, the absolute biggest, the absolute smallest. If I wanted to make it be a little more useful, I could do this by order ID. So for those of you that remember, there's roughly 47,000 orders. So this should return, uh, sorry, 43,000 orders. And it returned a total of 43,191 rows. And you'll see that for this order, which right now is completely useless because you don't know what this is for. When you look at it, it's just a series of numbers going across. Um, but if I add the order ID in this, just so you know what order number, now you can see for that order 25,330, the total order was $513. The most expensive row was 307, the cheapest one was 10 bucks and change. So right now we're doing math based on different orders. And it becomes slightly more useful because this is the kind of numbers managers care about. Currently I can't because I haven't shown you guys to do joins yet. I can't show you guys more useful as in, hey, I want to know for a certain block of time or anything like that, that that'll come in a bit. But I could actually add on one last clause, which is pardon me? Yeah. It can because they may have more than one order line. So the extended price right now, I'm only playing with order lines. Let me just go pull up So we're going to pull up the first 10 lines so you can see what's in here. It shows the ID, the order ID, what the product was that was ordered, how many were bought, what the price was, and what the line total was. And currently the order ID is not, it doesn't show in any given order. But if I had a multiple order IDs, um, hang on. I saw your hand at the back. Just hold on. There we go. This is all, this is one order. So it has a, a minimum amount, a maximum amount, and then the extended price for each line. So the maximum amount would be $307. The minimum amount would be $10.70. The sum would be all three added up together. And it's broken down by order ID. Just a little louder. Yeah, you can, um, which depending how far I get into today's lecture, I'll do a demo, otherwise it'll be next week. But yes, the, then you need a join, so you need to connect from more than one table. But for now, I just want to focus on the basic behavior of the aggregates and then we'll get fancy later. So this is back to run what I wanted to do earlier, which is here's the whole thing all grouped up together. And there's one more clause that's really important that you can use. So you guys learned about where last week, right? If you remember right. Where basically allows you to filter down the results 
above, it filters down what's being selected, which you have to take into account that if I go where I should give me something. Okay, so this you've seen. I'm just telling it where the order ID is less than 30,000. Straightforward. So what I just did is I filtered out any order above 30,000. 30,000 and up. That happens before the aggregate is run. So what it does is it, it, it looks through all the rows, it selects the ones that apply, and then it does the math. Just like you do with a survey or you do with any other piece of logic and it happens in a very logical manner. It will go, like I said, it'll it'll parse through the order lines, find anywhere that match the criteria and then do the math on the results. However, there's one more clause called having. Having allows you to filter on the results of the aggregate. So uh, this filters before it does the math. This filters on the results of the math. So having always, always, always follows group by because you cannot use having unless you have an aggregate. I've seen people cheat and use having instead of aware, which is kind of dumb. Why would you use a, an aggregate clause to filter results? You could, but it's kind of defeating why it's there. And I'm just going to switch over just for a second. All right, so having allows me to operate on math, on the results of the math. So what I'm going to say is I just want the totals for any order under 30,000 that had a grand total of $900 or well, greater than 900. If I run this, I'm down to 577 rows. So originally we started out with 43,000. I added my where clause, which brought us down to 4,700 and change. And now I said, I don't want any that are less than 900 bucks. I want to see the big ticket orders. And that resulted, brought me down to 577. And as you can see, every single one of these is more than 900. Some of them are close, 981. Actually, the smallest is 902.3. So that's the smallest sum. You can do it with the min, you can do it with the max. You can do whatever you want. It's all good. Uh, but those are, are the parts. I'm just going to try to... F no. All right, it's not letting me format. Oh, there it goes. Okay, there we go. Nicely formatted. So... That's literally, that's all there is to an aggregate. There's one last thing I have to teach you guys about aggregates. It's something you can't do yet. There's a way to do it, but I'll be teaching that in a bit. And it is doing an aggregate on an aggregate. Now, this sounds like something that's a brain dead idea. I want to know what the average total sale is. Plain English. Sounds like a normal kind of question you'd ask. You know, your sales manager comes up to you and he goes, Last month, what was the average total sale? So we have an average idea of what you know the sales were for the month. And you go, no problem. So then you'd go and say, I want to know what the average sum is. Verbally, it makes sense. And then you do this. Oops. First, you take your comma off. And it's going to say aggregate functions cannot be nested. And this is essentially saying you're not allowed to aggregate an aggregate. Here's why. An aggregate runs through. The aggregate will run through based on this. By now, the math has been done. You're asking it to do math after it's done doing math. The math, pro the math phase of the whole business is done. By the time it's done the sum, it can't go back in a second time and do math again. 
there is a way of doing it. And I'll, like I said, I'll show you guys hopefully today, if not at the start of next week, how to do it. And then it does the filtering at the end. And we never make it to here because we can't aggregate on an aggregate. But this is essentially what aggregates are. It's not that hard of a concept. You just have to play with it. Play with the different aggregates. Learn what the min and the max do. That kind of stuff. Um, there is one other little quirk. And if I go, I'm going to go back to my customers. So when you do a count, you can choose to count a specific column instead of count everything. And I'm going to hit run. And again, it's going to say 10,100. Do you remember last week when I spoke about distinct? Where it says do all the distinct values? You can throw in a distinct inside the count. This is, the, this is one of those weird things that a lot, not a lot of people know that SQL can do. And what this is going to do, instead of counting all the cities, it's going to count all the distinct versions of the cities. So if I run this now, I get 2,149 because there are 2,149 different cities, distinct cities. Okay? Yeah, if you take distinct out, there's 10,000 cities. So if you just go count, it counts every single iteration of every value. It doesn't care if they're repeated. It counts every iteration. If you tell it to do the distinct ones, it says, oh, we, here's Berlin, one. Oh, well, we saw Berlin again. We're not going to count it again because we've already seen Berlin once. So it counts only the unique versions of each value. This becomes important when you're dealing with data that's repeated many times. Um, let me go switch to the orders table to give you guys a better idea. So we know there's 10,100 customers, right? So if I were to count star from orders, 47,342 orders. If I were to count customer ID, again, 47,342. On the other hand, if I go count the distinct customer IDs, I find out that only 9,900 customers ever placed an order. All the other customers are just dead records. People that registered for your products or registered to your store never bought anything. People that called in the call center said, I'd like to place an order, and you start typing it in, hit save customer, and they go, ah, you know what, never mind, I don't want to buy that today. And then the order gets canceled and nothing ever happens with it. So when you count distinct values, it's handy to find, get rid of the duplicated values. It also makes certain kinds of queries faster because you're only dealing with the distinct values. Instead of repeating values over and over and over again, it only deals with the distinct values that's being returned. Therefore, it's working with a smaller subset of records. And I could, you know, if I want to, I can get even fancier and I could say, uh, customer ID on this, and I forgot the group by. So if ever you forget to include something in the group by, it's going to tell you. It's going to say column orders, customer ID must appear in the group by clause. If you see this show up, that means you forgot to put something in the group by clause and you need to put it there. And customer two placed one order and because I'm doing the distinct customer ID, it's always going to be one, as you can see, because they only ever place the one order. If I were to count star, then you'd find out how many each person, how many orders each person placed. So this customer placed five, uh, customer five, hang on, stop. This customer placed five orders, this customer placed six orders, this customer placed three orders all based on changing what's inside this one bracket makes a huge difference. Um, but aggregates is just math. If you can, 
if you're having a hard time figuring out how to do the aggregate, talk it out loud or write it out on a piece of paper what you're trying to add. I know odds are by the time you're done writing it out, you'll figure out how to write it in SQL because you'd write it almost exactly the same way in SQL as you would, you would in English. Um, it's just the way it is. Uh, so now I'm going to switch back to the slides to continue where I was. Any questions about aggregates before I continue? Going once, going twice, three times, moving on. This one here. Okay. Um, outside of aggregate functions, you also have other kinds of functions similar to what you'd have in most programming languages. There's string functions. They do pretty much what you'd expect a string function in a programming language to do. You guys have learned about string functions in Java yet? Trim. Uh, I could probably only learned about trim. Um, but there's other ones like substring, where you can search through a string to grab another string. Or whether it's in string, no, none of those, great. Um, there's lots of string functions, especially in SQL, uh, that allow you to do really nifty things. Um, and here's some useful ones. One of them you've already seen in this class, lower and upper. It allows you to convert the case of whatever you're looking at. So lower makes everything lowercase. Upper makes everything uppercase. Unless you're dealing with a language that doesn't have a case, such as Cyrillic. Everything's screaming in that language. Uh, or languages that don't actually have letters that are said use symbols, such as Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. There's no uppercase, lowercase in those languages. Uh, but, you know, Latin languages have uppercase, lowercase. Trim, I think you might have learned about that one in Java. With SQL, depending on what implementation, you actually have the choice of where you trim. You can trim the leading spaces, you can trim the trailing spaces, trim both. In other words, it gets rid of all the empty space at each end of your string. <coughs> it removes characters. Uh, substring allows you to split a string. So, for a fact, you only want the first three characters of a postal code. You can use substring to grab just the first three characters. So, you pass the arguments of, here's the string. You can tell it where you want it to start and for how many characters you want to grab. So, you can say, if you say, substring postal code uh, from one to three, it'll grab, grab the first three characters. And again, this is where SQL is a little different than what languages you, you may be learning elsewhere is in Java, strings are zero-based, as in the first character is zero. Same thing with Python and PHP. With SQL, the first character is character one. It's a one-based language, just to be different. Uh, there's a function called position. This one is not global to all database servers. The other ones have similar functions. Um, they are all called a little different. But position allows you to find a substring. It's like doing like. It's a similar to like, essentially, but you can actually choose um, a specific pattern if you want. Um, but what instead of returning the string, so let's say you're trying to say, if we did like, we go, could go like percent sign 613 percent sign, it would find 613 anywhere in a phone number. On the other hand, if you do position, 613, it'll tell you, hey, 613 is at position 1. Or it's at position 4. Or at position 7. I'm working my way down the phone number here, right? So if it's at position 1, that means it's the error code is 613. If it's at position 4, then it's the exchange. And if it's at position 7, it's the first three digits of the actual phone number. So position tells you where it is. It doesn't tell you what it found. It just tells you where it found it inside the string. And then the last one is actually a handy one, length. How long is it? Uh, very useful one. It's used in most languages. Uh, Java has length. Pretty sure it's uh, whatever string variable you got dot length brackets. You get a length. It gives you a number saying that this string is this long. So maybe you want to exclude strings of a certain length or strings that are too short or strings that are too long out of your search. Maybe you just want to exclude people with really long names because, you know, they have really long names as opposed to people who have short names. You want to, you know, target people with really, really short names. Uh, it's all kinds of things you can do with length. Uh, date functions comes next. 
and I'm, I'll do a few demos about these functions after. Uh, date functions are used to simplify working with dates. That's pretty much our whole purpose in life is. And the problem is that most of these functions are unique to each database server. So each server has specific functions and they, you know, they're all different. So, however, here's a few useful ones you may see. There's now, which is pretty much global. Now means now. You have extract. It allows you to pull out a specific part of the date. I, I did some of those last week when I was demonstrating dealing with dates, where I extracted the month. So it would just give you the, you know, the month part of the date or the day part of the date, or even the hour if you want. Um, and then you can add time. So you can actually take one date, add another date, and it will give you a third date. Which is kind of cool. Which is kind of hard to understand unless you actually see it in action. But there's, there's that. Um, and then there's numeric functions. Um, if we've all taken some sort of math, and hopefully we've all taken some sort of math by now, if not, you're really suffering in your calculus course. Here's a few useful functions. ABS does absolute value. Modulus, that's a handy one if you want to find out if a number is divisible evenly or not. The modulus returns the remainder. If there's no remainder, well, it's easily divided by the other number. Rounding. Pay attention to rounding. That one's kind of handy to have, especially for the practical exam. Especially if I ask you to round, round by hand because humans suck at rounding. We usually look at the first three digits and say good enough, and then you find out the sixth digit is causing everything to roll up because you suck at rounding. Um, floor. Gives you the integer or the numeric value by dropping any decimal places. So if it's 1.5 and you do floor, it'll be 1. And actually, I'm missing one in here. There's also one called ceiling. If it's 1.2 and you say ceiling, it'll give you, the answer will be 2. It'll give you the next number up from where you're at. Um, some people may wonder why you want to use something like floor or ceiling. Floor is good if you want to know the absolute value of a number without decimal places. So as long as it's between 1 and 2, you don't care. So whether it's 1.014 or it's 1.99993, that's all 1. And ceiling's the same thing. If it's 1.001, it's still 2. It basically forces the rounding up to the next place. Um, and then there's random. Want to roll some dice? That's what it's for. Um, or you need to create a salt for your passwords. Uh, most of you don't know what that is. Hopefully you'll learn it in your web development course. Uh, salting is important. It adds randomness to your password. Okay, now for some more, some more demo. Helps if you type the things in right. All right, so I'm going to start playing with um, with people's names. So I'm running name, selecting name. It gives me all the people's names. Now, you guys have seen lower. You've seen me use lower, but you've never actually seen the results of lower. If I run lower, you'll see that Everybody's name is now lowercase. And if I switch it over to upper, now everybody's a Chad screaming their people's names out. Everything's been made uppercase. It's basically you're checking that way. So if you're actually trying to do case insensitive matching, that's one way of doing it. You can make it lowercase, uppercase, and then match based on you know, the results of that. Now I can also go and of course I can't remember the arguments for that. And 
end. Let me sort. So now you'll see a bunch of eights, a bunch of seven, a bunch of sixes. What I'm telling you is give me the position of Dan, the letters D-A-N in name. And in other words, it's telling me where does it find Dan? As in other words, where's the D in name? And of course, it's case sensitive. Go figure. So if I were looking for lowercase d, there you go. Hang on. Now it starts at 4. That's all the Jordans, by the way, if you're curious which ones it was. It's all the Jordans. If I, let me pull up the name so you can see. For those of you that are from the front row, um, sort by position. There's all the Jordans, where the D-A-N is in the fourth spot. One, two, three, four. If I make it the uppercase D, and sort by that, I really should put the order by on here, so just make life easier, but now there's everybody who's, have, who's a Daniel. And as you can see, just because the last name is Daniel doesn't mean the D is always in the same spot. It's essentially going, well, Charlotte, Daniel, there's more letters before we get to the D. That's why it's in position 8. Now, can anybody take a guess how you'd make this case insensitive? No, there's no I like in this. I want to make the position match case insensitive. Anybody want to take a guess? Uh, well, not the select part, but yeah, you got the right idea. Just like in Java, you can nest your functions. You can't nest aggregates, you can nest functions. Uh, you can nest string function, math, like, you know, uh, numeric functions, that kind of stuff. You can't nest aggregates. Well, not yet. So in this case, it's going to find the position of DAN anywhere in the person's name. So now if I go execute and sort again one more time. Again, the eights will be there, but now we have the fours. So these are the Jordans and the Daniels. That one's in position 11. 10, 8, down, down, down. Those are some of the useful string functions. So lower is there, position is there. Let's say I just want to extract the last name. So for example, let's first things first, let me go show you the um, he keep hitting the wrong icon. From int okay, yeah. So what the heck did I call that? Yeah, it is substring. So this is saying from 1 for 5, and go execute. I'm pulling out the first five characters of a person's name. By the same token, I could say start at 5, 4, 5, and I'll be the middle part of people's names. Now, you, some people are wondering, well, why would, you want it, why would you want that? If I were to change this to, say, I want the first three characters of any given postal code. Now, for Canadian postal codes or British postal codes, it gives us the first three digits, which basically gives you the region. When you look at Ottawa, we have what K, K one to, you know, all the way down to K is nine. K two C is one area that's just over here, Bel Air Heights. Uh, K two D I think is just a little further east from there. And those are basically the, the different neighborhoods of each area. So we could actually do a search based on neighborhoods. So that's one of the useful tricks of the substring is you can extract just part of it. You do the same thing with a phone number. Uh, I don't have any phone numbers in this, but I could literally just grab the phone numbers, the first three digits. I want everybody in area code 613. So that would cover everybody in the Ottawa Valley. 
And while we're at it, we have to add 343 because then we have another area of code to deal with. But that's essentially a way of extracting certain customers based on ge geographic location without betting that they gave you the right city name. Or uh, For those of you that, have, that are from this general area know Ottawa, the different parts of Ottawa used to be different cities. Canada was its own city. Nepean was its own city. Gloucester was its own city, kind of. Uh, Orleans was its own city. And they amalgamated and made it all one big city. And people still, but when you write an address, you can actually still send mail it to Nepean or mail it to Canada. So instead of saying Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, Ontario, will still make it there because they use the postal code to route it. So you can't bet on the humans giving you the right information, but normally you can safely bet on phone numbers. You used to be able to bet on phone numbers and postal codes are safe. Um, however, substring has one other useful function. I'm going to go back to the people's names for a second. Let's say I just want to pull out people's first name. A little challenging right now. In theory, we could go, I could find everybody by first name by doing a like, but it's not letting me extract their first name. However, I can do a substring. So, as you can see, name from one for so many spots. So this would give me the first three characters. And it, try that again. There we go. Helps not having the extra comma in there. So I'm pulling up the first three characters. Kind of useful. Totally useless. However, let's say I want to, I want to know something. I could st add in here. Oh, I hope I wrote that right. Anybody want to take a guess what my mistake is? Pardon? No. It's a syntax error. Eh? I'm missing my second bracket. All right, so here's what's happening now. I'm going, give me the substring of the name. In other words, brick at the name. Starting in position one, four, and then I said, tell me where the space is. It's a cute trick. So what's happening is I'm telling you, okay, go find where the space is in every person's name. Give me that number. So we know that's where the space is. So then what we need to do is go, give me the name that's starting from one, and give me all the characters until he hit the space. That's what this is saying. You can do the same thing in Java by nesting string functions, by the way. Yes? That's what this is for which one? The position? No, position tells you the first one it finds. Uh, but the substring, I'm telling it, start from position one. Well, it'll go starting from one, grab everything starting at one until you hit the space. Now, let's say I want people's last names. I could actually just go from space and don't give it a maximum length. And that will give me, almost give me everybody's last names. But you may notice here, you might not see it, but there's a space right there. Because it's starting right at the position of the space. So... How would you go, make sure you go over one more? Mathematically, what would you do? What was, what'd you say? Yeah, plus one it. Right now we don't have that first space. Magic. Um, we, earlier we had a weird one where it found this guy was blank uh, because of the extra space in their last name. But the position will grab the very first time it finds it. There's no way to tell it to, to give you find the last space. Well, there's no way with the built-in SQL functions. There are ways of doing it, but uh, it gets significantly more complicated uh, using regular expressions and stuff. 
uh, way outside the scope of this course. But this is how, these are the most useful string functions you can get. Position lets you find where something is in the string. Substring allows you to slice it into smaller pieces. Lower makes it lowercase. Upper makes it screaming. Those are the four m most useful uh, functions. Now, let's talk about dates. There we go. Now, and as some as somebody in the front seat can really see, that's an awful lot of precision, right? So it's three fifty six o three. These are uh, that's what hundreds of a second, thousands of a second, ten thousandths of a second, hundred thousandths of a second, millionth of a second, ten millionths of a second of precision. Uh, I don't even know how many what that counts as nanosecond. Um, and then the minus four is the plus time zone. So it's saying it's minus four from GMT. So we're minus four from England. And that's now. Um, you can do some basic math. There's a function called, um, let me just double check it's what it's called because I was working in MySQL and it's all called the same thing. There it is. Right. So let's say you want to know everything for tomorrow. Let's say you have records that say, what are the appointments for tomorrow? So I could go, first things first, and go now as a date. And my, my cursor would unjam. So now we're just grabbing the today's date, which is cool. But I could say, there's two ways of doing this. You can go plus and that's going to be tomorrow. Yes, it is tomorrow. The number came back with, the date came back with. So what it's, you're telling it to do is today's date plus an interval. Anybody here know the definition for the, of what an interval is? Not database, I'm talking just plain English language. What's an interval? Anybody here watch races? Nobody watches any kind of racing at all? Not even foot race or nothing? Yeah, lap times, an interval. Well, no, an interval is a distance between two people, right? So if you're talking about what your interval time is, if it's just for you and you're doing multiple laps, is th it's the difference between each lap is your interval. Or if you're talking about formula, formula racing, what's the time between the first place and the second place? That's their time intervals, the distance between two times. So an interval in SQL means what is, you know, we're going to be working with it, a span of time. Not a specific date, a span of time. So you could say now plus an interval of one day. I could also go an interval of one month, and it's actually not picky about how you spell that. As you notice, I mis mixed case that. Now it's next month. Or I could go one year, one month. I hope that works. So in a year from now plus a month. So it'll be August 2nd, 2020. The interval functionality is really, really powerful. Way easier than trying to calculate it mental mentally. So, but another one that's really popular is whatever happened two days ago. So if you want to know everything that happened within the last week, you could go, you know, everything greater than that now minus seven days. So it would give you everything that happened in the last week. This is advanced SQL functionality in a way because, you know, f playing with intervals is a little challenging because, you know, it's thinking in time. And as most people in here will tell you, time is the worst thing to deal with. How many of you have a built-in clock? Rarely do you ever meet someone that can tell you what time it is. My wife was 
like that. She could tell you within 30 seconds what the time was, no matter what time of day it was. Built-in clock in her head. It was really creepy, actually. She never wore a watch, and she was never late for anything. I right, never looked at the time. She always knew when I was late. She didn't even look at the time either. You're late, I know. I've been looking at my watch for the last half hour because I know I'm running late. Intervals are great because it lets you do the math without having to do the math. It does gets the server to do the math for you, which is what it's good for. Humans suck at date math. No, I just did a minus right here. I subtracted. Yeah, you can, you can add two days, subtract two days. I mean, honestly, I could even get fancy and go like this. No idea what this is going to do. Tomorrow. I added three days, and I took away two days. It's just playing with time, right? If people are sitting there walking. I can see people with their finger going, okay, two days, three days in the future, two days back. That's tomorrow. And the, the computer doesn't need your finger. It does it for you. Um, often you'll use this more in the where clause because you can use this in the where clause. So you can start filtering based on ranges of dates if you want. Um, it's great. Well, at work, I wrote the timesheet system where I work, and when I do summaries, I literally work by plus one month. So I'll tell it now, comma, now, date, plus interval, one month. And... There, here's today, here's one month from today. And most people say, well, that's not that hard to figure out until you throw in a leap year. What's really cool about this is if there's a leap year in this, it actually calculates the one month taking leap year into account. So it's not going to go 1st of February, 1st of March. Oh, there's a leap year. It'll actually be 1st of February, 29th of February because, you know, you're adding 28 days because it's February. It actually knows... So you don't have to know. So those are date functions. And now, ah, now, um, do I actually have a pi function? So I've got a pi function. Couldn't remember if I had a pi function. I have a pi function. So I could go... Absolute value of pi, still 3.141593. So that's still the absolute value of it. But if I were to go floor, it's 3. If you floor pi, it becomes 3. If I were to ceiling pi, oh, come on. I had my brackets there already. It becomes four. Um, so that's what floor and ceiling do, which is, like I said before, if all you need to know is the lowest number, so what is the whole number, that's what floor is for. It ignores decimal places. It doesn't round. It cuts off, truncates the number. Now, if I were to go so I round three point four four five six. And it rounds down to three. But if I say I want it to round to two places, 3.45. Because that's how rounding works. So 
If you're dealing with numbers that have lots of decimal places and you want to round it, the function is called round. First argument is the number you want to round. The second one is how many decimal places of precision you want to do. If there's anything you'll, you're going to write down from today, this is the function to remember. It's the most useful numeric function of the bunch, especially for your practical exam. Just a big hint there. You may want to know how to may learn want to like a computer to do the rounding for you. Um, so that's rounding, not a hard concept. The next one is random. Random gives you a number between zero and one. Sounds like stupid. What do you do? Flipping a coin? No, it gives you a, you know, a, a basically a floating number between zero and one. And if I keep going round, everything after the decimal place changes. So, how how you how is it useful? It is normally, you multiply by how many p digits you want to reserve. So let's say I want to do. Um, times 10 will let me have one digit. And then if I go keep rounding, multiplying that, it's just moving the digit over. However, if you multiply it by 6, for example, you'll notice that the number is kind of weird because it's never really a multiple of 6, and it's not moving over by one decimal place completely. It's taking that random number and multiplying it by 6. And if I do this, times 6 plus 1, it always guarantee that the number is at least 1. Because theoretically, you could multiply it and that not be 1. If the number was like 0, 0, 0, 1 times 6, it'll be 0, 0, 0, 6, right? Anybody want to take a guess what this functionality is? This specific one. Actually, I'll make it a little better first. So there's no decimal places to confuse you. So I'm randomly generating numbers between 1 and 6. This would also be known as what? Yeah, no. A dice roll. See, if you didn't come up with that, then here's a 20. Now, randomly generating number between 1 and 20, what's that called? It's a D20, right? Anybody here play D&D? &D? Anybody here ever open up a game of Dungeons & Dragons? Pathfinder? Any of these? There's your random dice roll right there. So, here's your random number between 1 and 20. Man, I'm getting some really critical fails. Oh, there's a critical success. Oh, and now we've got a plus three modifier. There we go. <laughs> D20 plus three. Um, so this is how you randomly generate numbers. You can literally get your SQL server to be your dice roller for, if you want to up your nerd cred a little, and they want to guarantee that your dice rolls are always not loaded, you'd use this. Um, it is also handy to, let's say, remember earlier I was playing with dates? I'm going to throw in a couple of functions and glue them all together for you. Yeah, it's going to look, oh, I hope this works on the first try. No. Hang on here. One bracket, two brackets, three brackets, four. Bracket, two brackets, three brackets, four brackets. You know, I've done this example before, right? 
you think you get it right on the first try. Because we know this works. No, days in the brackets. See, there's the matching bracket for the... Yeah, I'm just having... No, what I'm trying to do is randomly generate any, any number of days between 1 and 20. And have my examples are not going to work. I'm going to have to try it. I'm not going to waste a lot of time trying to figure out what I did wrong. Um, but... Plus interval. Yeah, it's not liking what I'm trying to do. I'll have to go dig up my example from previous years. Because I usually get it right on the first try. So I'm just doing something stupid. But essentially I was trying to randomly generate a number between 1 and 20 for a number of days. So if you're trying to, you know, create a date... Pretty sure that's not what it was either. Yeah, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Darn. That's that's concatenate, yes. Yeah, SQL's concatenate's weird. It's double pipe. So Yeah, no, it's whatever I'm doing is it's not liking this. So whatever, I'm not gonna fight with it at the moment. Um because I know this works because I was just using it. And I know that works because I was using it earlier. If I said, okay or not, what? Oh, I'm dumb. That's really bugging me now. Anyways, I know what I'm doing wrong, but I don't know why I'm doing it wrong. All right. So I'll probably try it and get you guys the answer later. I'll fight with it later tonight at home because this should work. Um, okay, so that was the date functions. That was the number functions. That was uh, various other functions. Um, what time is it? Okay, I'll start into the next topic and then I'll, I'll end it fairly short afterwards and I'll finish it next week. Uh, um, so the next topic is joins. Joins hurts, just so you know. It's probably the most painful topic in SQL because it takes, the only way to really understand joins is to play with joins is literally to play with a join um, now jo a join is allows you to extract data from more than one table at once so earlier somebody's asked me a question can we do the aggregates based on the results of a date or do we want to add up all the orders that were on a certain date or order up all the sum up all the orders for a given customer the problem is that the order lines don't have the customer information. The customer information is attached to the order. The only way to actually do that math is to join the two tables. And essentially what it does is it finds all the matching records based on the kind of join you're using, and it lines them up, and then it gives you a matching row that contains every column from both tables. Or if you're selecting specific columns, just the matching columns in each row from both tables. The most common type you of join use is known as the inner join. 98% of the joins you're going to create in your career are going to be inner joins, probably 99%. That's essentially what I do for a living, and all I ever use is inner joins. Uh, occasionally, I'll use the odd left join. Never use a right join. OK? 
because the same thing as a left join. Um, what it does, it looks at the match between the two tables based on your foreign keys or whatever criteria you select. And it'll collate the results and then return them to you. There's two syntaxes. There's the old syntax. So when you go online and you Google how to write a join in SQL, you'll get one of two kinds of syntax. You get the old style, which was pioneered by Oracle. From, then you give it a list of tables that are comma delimited, and then in your where clause, you tell it how they're interconnected. So from A comma B, where AID is equal to B dot A underscore ID. That's the old syntax. The modern one actually uses the keyword called join. So from A, join B, on, then you tell it what the point of commonality is. The point of commonality means what do these two tables have in common? And it's not always a foreign key and a primary key. Normally that's what it is, but you can join across any two columns. Will it be useful? Not necessarily. But you can join. It does, the join doesn't force you to foreign key to primary key. That's not forced that way, but that's normally what you do. And so the point of commonality is, is how are these two tables connected? Like I said, normally it's a foreign key. So in the table A, its primary key is called ID. In table B, we have a foreign key called A underscore ID, name, following the same naming conventions I've been using. So from A, join B on A dot ID is equal to B dot A underscore ID, which is the foreign key. Uh, when you deal with inner joins, the keyword inner is optional. So you'll often see me, I never, almost never write inner join. I just write the word join because it assumes inner by default. And I will demonstrate the the inner join. And then I'll worry about left, right joins and that kind of stuff next week. So earlier somebody said, you know, can we figure out the results of some stuff? So if I went select star from customer. Okay, we're getting tired of seeing select star from customer. I got it, but. Hello? Customers. Yeah. So right now I get 10,000 rows back. Unless I want to find out all the orders that belong to the customer. So I go join orders. So I'm going to say, give me everything from customers. I'm going to connect orders to the customers. So now I want to know what orders the customers, orders the customers placed. But I have to tell it, how are they interconnected? If I do this like, just like this, and I don't tell it how it's connected, it's going to do a different kind of join. It's called a natural join. And this is where database servers try to get smart. And depending on what naming convention you're following, the smart will work or it won't. Because I'm not following the natural join naming convention, I'm going to get an error. Fantastic. Um, with a natural join, what happens is it looks, some database servers will actually look at what columns these two tables have in common, and they'll join across it. Since they both have an ID column, they'll join across ID. Totally useless because they're, they're both primary keys. But if I tell it, now it's going to go, I want everything from customers. And while you're at it, I want stuff from orders too. And I tell it, this is how they're connected. And sometimes if this isn't obvious, so you'll want to go and look at your diagram to figure out what the relationships are. This is where your handy physical ERDs come in a, into its own because that way you actually know for a fact what the interconnections are. So I'm going to hit execute. And it's going to take a little longer. Now I got 47,342 rows. Essentially, it's showing me every order for every customer. Here's my order information off on the right. So here's all my customer information to the left. And then on the right is the order information. So when you think about joins, we're talking from left to right. What they mean by left to right is the very first table is left. The next table is to the right. If I do one more join, which I will do right where will I will add it. Yeah. 
So this is to the left, this is to the right, this is more to the right. The, the easiest way to visualize it is if you put everything on one line. The leftmost table is the first table to the left, even in your results. The rightmost table will be what's to the far right. And I'm going to run this, and it's going to take a while. We're st it's still working on it. There we go. It's 114,000 rows because there's 114,000 order lines in the system. So you can see each customer, their address. Then we got the order information. And then we got the order lines. This is not useful, just so you know. This is just extra information. Uh, I really wish it would tell me how many K it transferred. So how big physically was this data set? This is normally not how you'd, you'd handle this. This is useful for, you know, if you're just trying to do a warehouse backup or a, um, a denormalized table <coughs> so that you have every column available to you in a no longer uh, properly normalized database. However, where things get handy is when you start adding a where on here. Oh, single quotes, please. So now it's going to give me all the order lines for Berlin. Somewhat more useful. And we can make this a little nicer. We can go, give me the name and the order date and the extended price for Berlin. Now, do you notice how much faster that was? Because I'm asking for less information back, so it's not having to return huge rows. Now, some of you are still saying, well, how useful is this still? Let's just say we want to know what the total was. And I think it was you that asked that question. Can you add up the sum based on a given date or a given customer? I could literally go sum the extended price. And now I know how much each order was total. So what I'm doing here is I'm telling it, okay, I want from customers. I'm going to connect orders in their order lines. I'm filtering to Berlin. This I've shown you already. But now I'm, go I'm going to run the aggregate so that it's sorted by the person's name and the order date. So it goes through every single order line for anybody who's in Berlin. And then it adds up all the order lines based on the person's name and the order date. Now, this isn't perfect because we know there's more than one person in a given city with the same name. But it's fairly reasonable. Uh, you could make it more precise by you know, doing the grouping by customer ID instead. That way, the different people with the same name in the city would be showing up as different orders. Um, I could take out the date. So if I just want to know how much a given person ordered, regardless of their date, I'll get a lot less rows. Because I had 2,000 rows. And I got 500 rows. So this Renault David guy spent 2,000 bucks total. I wonder who the biggest spender is. Apparently, Melanie Muller from Berlin is actually a big spender, 8,000 bucks. Total, that's what she spent total history-wise. But that is, that answers the question she had earlier about how would you add up, you know, results in a child table. So the most important part to remember about joins is it goes from left to right. So this table is there. If you're going to join to a table, so this orders right now is joining to customers. Customers must be to the left. So let me put it all on one line so that it's a little easier to visualize. See, orders is joining customers. Customers must be to the left of orders. Otherwise, you have an error. You cannot join a table that to another table that's not in there already. For example, I'll move order lines. I hope it doesn't make a liar out of me. 
So right now I'm joining order lines to orders, but orders isn't listed yet. I should be getting an error. It's saying, hey, you don't have a from clause entry for orders. I do, but it happens to be afterwards from left to right. So if you're going to join anything, it has to join to a table that's already joined in. And where is it in? To the left. Or for everybody facing me, it'd be in this direction, to your left. Um, if you don't know what your left and your right is, you might have a problem. But overall, that's the order it happens in, left to right. Um, the other important thing you need to know about is, no, there's no limit how many tables you can join. You can join as many tables as you want as long as they're sane relationships between them. In theory, I could actually run a query in this ThinkCube database that joins almost every table and does something with it. I could spend the next 10 minutes writing up a query. Is it useful? Not always. Normally, when you're running reports, you're only grabbing the pieces that you need because the more tables you join, the more overhead you add, the more overhead you add, the more expensive the query is, the more expensive the query is, the longer it takes to run, which means you're slowing things down for everybody else. So when you do join, another thing to remember when you do a join is you want to remember to join just the bare minimum. And, and that this is the modern syntax. Not the customers comma orders comma order lines bit. Um, it's painful to work with when you do that because it's all part of the where clause. Uh, this is also more efficient just so you know. Um, so this is enough to get you started in Lab 9. Literally what I just finished doing right now is pretty much all of Lab 9 and 10. So what's going to happen next week is I'm going to cover left joins and right joins. I'm also going to talk about Cartesian joins. Those suck. Um, there's a really fun example on how to do it, and I just got to set it up. Yes? Um, a Cartesian join, uh, hang on, yes, depending on the database server. Yeah, to everything else, creates a matrix. Um, and after that, I'm going to talk about subqueries, which will resolve the issue about the aggregate on the aggregate. And then that'll be the, pri the basis of the primer for SQL. Um, that's enough brain melt for one day. So I'm going to hit the stop record button now so that you guys have this. And then next week we'll wrap up the rest of this.